can the past and the present talk to each other? And if they can, how would they do it? And who would they do it through? This is a pretty ponderous question, but I've got a great guest on to help me deal with it. It's a former show guest, Michelle Dieter. She's returning to the show to help me ponder not just time and dreams, but we'll also be talking about the ideal qualities a translator of Chinese to English, or maybe any translator could have, what the fundamental differences between Chinese and English, that is the languages, are, and even how our own psychology can mess about with how we use commas. And as a wee bonus for any of you like me who were ignorant of this until very recently, what the two commas in Chinese or written Chinese are and what purpose they serve. And of course, we really shouldn't forget that Michelle and I will be talking about an author this episode. Uh, that is Song Aman and her story, Gong Sun's Dreams. It's a great story. Very excited to be having a chance to well, both read it and talk about it. But before we launch into any of that, let's launch into something else, the Trisha Fake News. So our first piece of news is, I think it's, this is a follow-up to a news item we had in the last episode where I talked about uh, the author Fang Fang, who's writing or was writing a diary slash blog from Wuhan and how some of it was available um, in English and Chinese on different places on the internet. Well, perhaps unsurprisingly, that book has been snatched up by one of the big international publishers, HarperCollins. And it's going to, well, it's, yes, it's been translated into English and it's going to be available to buy, I think, later this year. I think it's been titled Wuhan Diary and there's been some controversy about its subtitle. I think the original subtitle was Diary or Writing from the Original Epicenter. That caused some upset inside China. So I think it's been changed to a diary or, or whatever from a, from a city in lockdown. So both those things are accurate, but one is uh, perhaps less provocative, let's say. Let's leave um, any discussion as to whether or not uh, you should change book subtitles for, for reasons like that. But anyway, uh, the book's also available in uh, German, so it's been translated to English and German, but I'm uh, more uh, informed about the English edition. So that's our Fang Fang news item. Our second news item is also about a Chinese author who passed away, I think, on the 4th of this month. It was Rao Pingru, and it's a it's a sad to sad to see Rao uh, pass away, because he has one work in translation translated by Nikki Harman, which is although I've not read it, it, it looks really lovely. It's called Our Story, and Our Story is um, basically it's a series of paintings which are described by Rao. Paintings are by him, and it's about the marriage he had with his wife, like their life together, and it's. Um, I know enough details to know it's a very poignant and beautiful story. So, of course, while Rao was still alive, it was a good idea to check that book out. But now, I think particularly in his memory, go look up the book. And if it takes your fancy, why not order yourself a copy? If it's translated by Nikki Harmon, you know it's good stuff. So, uh, the third piece of news. This is a self-referential piece of news. This one's about a way I've devised, hopefully a better way I've devised, for you guys, the listeners, to uh, talk to each other and also talk to me. So, um... At the suggestion of an esteemed uh, translator and listener of the show, uh, Dylan Levi King, I've moved the little group chats I've been making from Instagram, which obviously not everyone has, and Instagram's not really known for its group chats, to a Discord server. So if you don't know what Discord is, essentially it's a, it was designed for gamers, but anyone can use it, and it's like a, it, you can work as a program on your computer, and as an app on your phone, and you can have multiple group chats going within one uh, wider group, all gathered around a community or a common interest or whatever. And uh, I'm able to add people to it by sending them an invite link. So uh, before I upload this episode, I'm going to add the Discord link, invite link to the little link tree thing I have, the list of all the various links, which is my pinned tweet on Twitter and is in my Instagram, or the, the podcast Instagram bio. But I'll also maybe retweet um, tweet once more the invite link just so it's available for you guys to find with one click so to speak so yeah um, if, if you'd like to talk to other fans of the show or leave feedback about the episode the discord is going to be a fantabulous place to do that so that's all the trisha fake news i think we're ready to march on to the interview my chat with michelle dieter and a 
I'll be saying this at the end of the interview, but I'll say it again here. It was fab to have her back on the show. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this interview. I certainly enjoyed conducting it. So we've got Michelle Dieter on the show. Hi, Michelle. Lovely to have you on. Um, now, you've been on before. This is a return. But for anyone who didn't catch the first episode you were in, which was on uh, Chen Zijin's The Untouched Crime, can you tell us a wee bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a Chinese English translator and interpreter. I handle everything from birth certificates to crime fiction, um, but I really enjoy the variety in my job. So far, I have translated five books. Some of those are fiction and some of those are nonfiction. Mm-hmm. I, I only know about um, two of them, uh, uh, The Untouched Crime, which we did, and uh, Paper Tiger, the one with Nikki Harmon on, I guess, the state of China. Are the, are the other ones of interest? Um, the first book I translated was probably the most popular author in terms of how Chinese readers view him. Oh, it's fun um, time. Yes, Beijing, Beijing. Forgot that one, sorry. Well, it's not necessarily my proudest work because I took it because I was just excited to get any job. Mm. <laughs> and then I translated an e-book. It was of book length, but um, I don't know. It's not really available in bookstores. Okay. Very recently, I translated um, kind of a semi-autobiographical like business book. Um, that was published by a U.S. publisher. I think it was Sage in the end. So it's kind of only available at academic locations. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So what's been going on in the world of Michelle Dieter since you were last on the show? I've actually been quite busy. So uh, I've been teaching this term, this academic term at Leeds, teaching them translation classes. I've been teaching interpreting classes at Manchester, and that's on top of the teaching that I normally do at Newcastle. <laughs> so right. before lockdown, I was in three cities. Uh, almost every week. Mm. And uh, I gave a speech on fiction translation in London uh, in February, which was really awesome. And right now I'm working on two books, working on getting uh, a grant for one book and working on, you know, on the sentence level in the trenches on another book. Fantastic. Keeping busy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And just uh, to help listeners who are not so familiar with the geography of England, uh, Leeds Manchester, Newcastle, those are all up in the north, the north of England. Yeah, hopping over from Manchester to Leeds is basically an hour, if you don't count, like door to door. Mm. And from Manchester to Newcastle is three, three and a half hours, depending on if you have to change. Yeah, it's a little crazy, but Newcastle is my alma mater. It's my mu (laughs) xiao. Right. So I'm willing to uh, trek further just to meet up with those people. Yeah, I don't know if I brought this up on the episode about Han Song with uh, Nathaniel Isaacson because we talked a little bit about trains and the crappiness of trains in the US and UK versus uh, China with their fast rail network. But a real bummer about the UK going east-west like like you 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 are like from uh, Manchester to Newcastle. The speed that you can go north-south, like for example the north of England to London, is pretty high, but east-west yeah. it's often abysmal. That's true. I mean, this year at the beginning when I was going to Leeds and stuff, sometimes I got newer trains and I feel like it makes a massive difference Mm. being on a new train with, you know, nice tables and um, I don't know, just slightly better facilities. Mm -hmm. I don't mind the speed much because I don't have a car out here. So it's like, you're going to get me there probably on time. I'll take it. (laughs) Yeah. And if it's in comfort, all the better. I think I know some of the new trains you're talking about. I think I've been on them. But it doesn't seem uh, massively, massively relevant to what we're here to talk about, uh, which is <laughs> Song Aman, the, the writer Song Aman. But before we talk about her, you had a wee bit of feedback um, about the name, about characters uh, with names that mean something. Uh, for example, a character called Jian Guo. And I'm completely blanking where this came up in which episode which is a bit embarrassing. So this came up, you met a taxi driver named Tian Guo. Yes. And at the same time that I listened to your podcast, I was reading about a character in a book, the book that I'm working on right now, whose name is something Jian Guo. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, no way. <laughs> that, <laughs> what's the likelihood that that would happen, you know, for me overlapping in the same day? Mm. Um, but it's uh, talking about the translation of names comes up a lot and it is always tricky and fun 
I remember Helen Wong, who's an excellent translator, talking about how she decided to translate a Chinese person's name as Carlos, and everybody mm. else, I think, was in、um, the pinyin equivalent for Taiwan, if I remember right. right. And that was because the main character、um, kind of、uh, gets really into a puppet, and then the puppet needs to have a name that is based off of that character's name. And、so it was Carlos and Carlotta, or something like that. I wish I looked、right. this up. Anyways, so she ended up going for、um, kind of a surprising choice, like something that you'd never expect. But when she explained her reasoning, I thought, yeah, that works pretty well.、Mm-hmm. And I think for if it's a modern text and it doesn't have something really、um, specific about it, where you could argue, oh, we might want to translate this according to meaning. Pinyin is probably going to be the way to go. Even though pinyin is tiring to read, right? If you've never learned it, sure, you don't know how to pronounce it in your head. <laughs> I mean, I guess Jianguo for someone like me who has a basic command of Chinese, it's okay for you. Of course, it's fine. But yeah, for someone who's never seen pinyin before, how are they going to say that Jianguo or something? They might, and they might find that tiresome, or they might repeat it to someone who speaks Chinese and laughs at them because they can't say Jianguo. Yeah, so I feel like that's something to keep in mind. But then at the same time, when I was reading Harry Potter as a thirteen-year-old, I did not <laughs> mind that、uh, Hermione was a name I had never encountered before. So for the first two books, I read it as Hermione, and I、yeah. just kept going. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know. If, did we talk about this before in the last episode? But I, I'm sure I re- related the story of Hermione's name and how I how I had the same conundrum as, as a kid, not reading Harry Potter, but having it read to me because I, I got the, the first book like aged five. So my、wow. dad, yeah, my dad took on the duty of、um, of, of of reading it to me, and he hadn't. He, I guess he would never admit it, but he hadn't seen Hermione before either. So he was calling her <laughs> Hermione. <laughs> And then one day, I was on holiday with my granny and granddad,、uh-huh. and I guess Hermione is a name from my granny's time. So she saw it and just naturally said Hermione, and I was like, "No, granny, that's Hermione." And she's like, "Who told you that?" <laughs> and it was my dad, who's not her child. That's her.、Um, oh, okay. On the other、is. side, granny on yeah, the other side. Son-in-law,、oh, wow. but post-divorce, so I'm not sure what the term is. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. Oh my gosh! But getting back to Jianguo before we, you know, drown in a tangent,、um, it it really depends because footnotes are popular in some texts. Like I think in the in the、uh, A Hero Is Born book, I think she ends up using footnotes a couple of times. Yeah, and the names in that book are particularly tricky. Well, she also got the chance to do a translator's note and explain her、mm. choices, which I think is an excellent way of doing it.、Uh-huh. But Amazon Crossing has a strict no footnotes policy. Right. So if I was translating for that particular client, I just wouldn't get the chance to explain that, and that means either I have to ask for a translator's note. Or you know, go on podcasts and explain the cool tidbit to people that might be interested. <laughs>、uh-huh. um, so I think footnotes people、um, are usually willing to read them or are willing to skip over them if they don't care.、Mm-hmm. But if it's going to be genre fiction, people don't expect it. And I think、uh, American publishers, in particular,、uh, are just kind of prejudiced against them. Let's say it's just. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> not can, interested in having them. I can say from like the point of view of a publisher slash、uh, typesetter. So typesetting being the job of laying out the text in the book.、Um, mm-hmm. Not having footnotes is incredibly easy.、Um, adding footnotes、uh, that go like at the end of a chapter or at the end of a book that's a bit fiddly.、Uh, and putting the footnotes at the bottom of the page, i.e., where the reader wants them, like easy access, that is a、uh-huh. bit of a pain in the bum and would add like time. Onto the production of this, like the typesetting, and therefore they're pre- getting this book from manuscript to something that can go to the printer. And there's just so many fiddly things in typesetting, especially if you're, if you know, trying to do a good job of it. That maybe the reason Amazon Crossing don't want footnotes, aside from having just the books being purely the text, is、yeah. they're a very streamlined company. Who put out a lot of you know because they've got a lot of、Chinese、time is money yeah yeah time is money and the the best way to make money I guess for in, sometimes in publishing is the volume if you if you're putting out books that won't sell massively and are only going to make a small bit of money back then your best strategy is get lots of books out and the best way to do that is be streamlined and you know. 
discard extra frivo- 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 frivolities like footnotes. I never even thought of that aspect. That's really interesting. Yeah, well, I guess a footnote at the bottom of a page is so simple to read. But um, when I was doing yeah. my uh, publishing masters, we had a project where you had to take an out of copyright uh, book by a Scottish author and make your own version from scratch. And I chose uh, David Hume, a David Hume book, The Philosopher. Most people did uh-huh. a fiction book. I thought I was being very clever doing a philosophy book until I had to um, create all the footnotes myself from PDFs. That I got oh. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. fun. Um, so as, as much as I love footnotes as a reader, I can appreciate why Amazon Crossing or other publishers would not want to do them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Also, Chinese tidbit. Mm-hmm. Um, the way of saying... Uh, selling a lot and making a small margin on each book or whatever it is you sell. Mm-hmm. It's li bo duo xiao. <laughs> li bo duo xiao. Yeah, so li profits, bo mm-hmm. to be thin, uh, duo lots, and xiao to sell. Li bo duo xiao. Yeah, I just I had to throw that in there when she mentioned it. <laughs> That's a good one. What I've not started doing yet is putting our words of the day with pinyin in the show notes. So mental note to do that for this phrase. And the actual word of the day, which I guess will be coming up. Hopefully you've got one to surprise me with. Definitely. Cool. All right. So we could talk about footnotes for probably another half hour. But instead, <laughs> uh, let's talk about Song Aman, our author for this episode. So can you tell us a little bit about her? And what's drawn you to her and her work? Sure. Song Aman is from Ningxia, which is a rural part of China. And she's relatively young. She's about my age. And um, she writes in this really beautiful style that I really enjoy. I think um, I first encountered Song Aman's work on a website called One, which is called Yiga in Chinese. Mm. And you can either read on an app or you can kind of search for it online and read online. Their um, SOP is to just do one short story by a Chinese author every day. So I don't know if you remember from the conference in Leeds, like some of these online fiction websites are terrifying because there's too much to click on. Like, <laughs> Right. It takes a number. really long time. The, uh, the, the guy who was studying them had made a comprehensive list of all the subgenres and subcategories and he read them out to us um and the one that i remember is i don't know if it sounds more natural in chinese but there was a subgenre of a subgenre called fat guy yeah it's just like um anyways so that particular website really drew me in with a very simple and clean format Mm -hmm. and it also it tends to feature like younger authors and um kind of fiction that the people who run the site like and i like their taste i guess um i saw song aman's stories one of her short stories on there and um i was just really drawn to it i connected with the protagonist i've connected with the idea of uh and kind of waiting anxiously for a train let's say and how you've got this idea of a city is hot um but also standing in a crowd of people is hot in a different way i just found that she described things in a really authentic way i really enjoyed it mm. so i got some help from a friend to contact song Aman and asked if i could translate it for paper republic and she said yes so we've been communicating through that um i remember there was a translator that gave a talk at the london book fair i don't know how many years ago this was but someone asked you know what kind of stories are best suited for translation and that's like basically an impossible question. <laughs> right. But the translator still answered it and said that it tends to be the case that having a little something in a story that's universal and a little something that is special to that country is what makes a really good book to be translated. Yeah. And I think that Song Aman manages to do that. So she has characters that experience universal emotions, but she'll either use historical references or cultural items or, you know something that is distinctly Chinese to give you a flavor of being in another place. And I think, I think you're, that matches my experience uh, as a reader, definitely. The ones I've enjoyed have both of those elements. And the story, the little uh, Song of Man short story we've got picked today, um, Gong Sun Stream does that. And it, it strikes me, it does it in an interesting way, not just about um, the local and the global or local specific and universal global yeah. uh, but also about time so that modern china is a globalized place there's lots of things that are familiar because 
people there are consumers, we are consumers, and we don't consume totally different things. But also um, the past reaches into the present in the story, so like pre, pre-globalized China. So the China from the past that is kind of, I don't know, bubbling under the surface of the story and the way we'll get into is a nice way to give the specific, like think back at, back in the day when every country really was different from whatever country existed on the other side of the planet from it. Or even from its neighbors, you know? Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. going to say that, but I thought it's, I guess China did have <laughs> things in common, if it, in common with its neighbors if we're, being, um, if we're being pedants, but yeah. Well, come at me, pedants. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I like pedants. Um, I wouldn't mind spending yeah. time with them. Um, I, I do want to ask you, just, well, I'm, I'm not an expert, but for listeners who heard you say uh, she's from Ningxia, a rural part of China, uh, can you tell us, like, where's Ningxia on the map and what, why it's maybe a bit different from other places? Uh, Ningxia is part of northwest China. It is, um, it is an autonomous region, so... Um, it works basically the same as a province or, I don't know, a state in the United States, mm. but it has uh, slightly different rules and it's supposed to cater more to um, a certain ethnic group. Uh, I guess that's the simplest kind of explanation yeah. I could give to you. And speaking of ethnic groups, um, Song Aman, I guess on her ID card, is not a Han Chinese. She's a different, one of the different ethnic groups inside China. Um, can you tell yes. us? I don't know how much, how important this is, but it's at least interesting. She's Hui, right? Yeah, she's from the Hui minority. And um, I don't know, I, I'll have to ask her myself or, you know, maybe someday we'll get her on the show. Um, <laughs> but I think that it just, it helps her appreciate that there's different sides to China and that China is a very diverse place. Mm. So every once in a while, you do get authors that forget that and kind of package China in a certain way. And of course, you get people outside of China that think China is a monolith. Mm-hmm. So Song Aman, having kind of this more interesting background, knows that China is interesting and writes about it in a nice way. Yeah. And uh, we did have a, well, I have a, a listener who's really into reading, um, I guess, a term I would use is, is like Islamic fiction from around the world. Um books by authors from Islamic communities or who are writing about the religion. So the, the Hui ethnicity are, I guess, a quote-unquote um, Muslim ethnicity, but the religion, we we discussed this a little bit before the show, doesn't really have much to do with Song Aman's writing. But again, it's well, just... I'm afraid not. <laughs> you know, but yeah, yeah. Um, just a, a, an interesting wee thing. Um, before we get into more substantial uh, chat about this author. So um, you've said to me and also written elsewhere, I, I guess online, uh, some things about Song Aman. Um, you've stressed, if I'm getting this right, that she writes about, and maybe in some ways for women, but um, in the story that you you sent me for this episode, Gong Sum's Dreams, our main character is, he's a guy. And she seems to take like his experiences and plights quite seriously. And you also sent me a little sort of TED style talk she did um, called Song of Man's Rubik's Cube, I think. And again, she was um, in that talk. She talks with a lot, I don't know if concern or care sound too condescending, but she talks really genuinely about the uh, plights of the working men in the, the mining town she was from, as well as talking very sincerely about um, the, the women miners or the women who were uh, involved in the mine. So, um, yeah, I, like my slightly subjective feeling was that she was talking about these old, like her old school friends and stuff with the same tone she was talking about her family and extended family as if everyone was her cousin or her sister or her brother. So I don't know, do you, um, is this such as my own projections or have I caught something about the way Song Aman talks and writes about everyday life? Um, I guess if you're if you're saying that she's kind of a humanist and she thinks yeah. that all humans have value, I would say yes. I think mm. that's central to her work. Um, if I wanted to try to think of two characteristics for how she writes, I'd say first of all she has a range. You know, right. if you think about an actor like a singer, um, if they don't have range, then all their stuff sounds exactly the same. Uh, we yep. were making a joke last night about Nicolas Cage always having the same angry face. <laughs> I I have a, a lot of thoughts about Nicolas Cage, but one is that he's got at least two bits to his range. He does like a kind of slightly downbeat, depressed dad, and then uh-huh. he's screaming Nick Cage. 
Sometimes he does both. But yeah, right. but yeah, he's so he's that's range for range. anybody. Yeah. <laughs> or me and my girlfriend were watching a Tom Hanks film recently, or a film with Tom Hanks, uh, Saving Mr. Banks, uh-huh. and um, I really like him. But yeah, he kind of always plays not the same guy, but a likable. Uh, yeah, person. plays the nice guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So. So some people don't achieve range. They kind of write the same story every time. And I think Song Aman is special because she can make her main character kind of any age, any background, uh, different education levels. And it still feels very authentic. It feels like uh, you get sucked right in. Right. Um, The other thing I'd say about her is that she has strong powers of observation. So since she cares about people, um, she uh, just notices all the details, I guess is how I'd put it. So that speech that you're talking about, the Rubik's Cube, which, by the way, we are working on getting permission to put the subtitles up. So search for her on YouTube, and hopefully she'll be up pretty soon. Fantastic. Um, when she when she talks about her childhood and specific events that happens, she just makes the listeners feel like they know exactly what that person felt, even though Song Aman didn't feel it herself, and you know the listeners are also separate from it. It just blows my mind how good she is at observing details and then choosing the details that are the most persuasive. Mm -hmm. So I think she does a really good job of cutting right to the marrow and getting the interesting stuff in a story. Yeah. And um, speaking of range, as well as like the range of taking the perspective or walking in the shoes of different protagonists, um, I feel like the story you sent me has a lot of range as like you've been describing, a really great and sensitive portrayal of everyday reality in people's lives. But also there's like, it's not quite genre fiction, but there are magical or supernatural or weird, whatever you want to call them, elements in the story that one, are done really well, and two, don't clash at all with the kind of realistic side of the story. And I guess that's a sign of range as well, because they're, it's it all reads as natural and, you know... A confident writer doing this <laughs> the sentence isn't going anywhere but you, you see what i mean yeah no i just feel like you know if you want to put it in one word she feels authentic no matter what she's writing about yeah yeah um so y- you mentioned that you've had a little bit of correspondence with song Aman. has that been really fruitful and has, has it been helpful for you as a translator yes definitely um so when i first translated 49 degrees i asked her questions like you know what is this person doing here or you know questions to make sure i understood the text and then we had a little break and um now i've been in contact with her again lots of emails back and forth and if i may i might insert a little tip for translators that want to get into literary translation please do Um, so if you're out there and you want to translate something you really should get permission to publish And if you're working from Chinese to English, it makes sense to make a lot of Chinese friends. I mean, lots of Chinese friends. And then use your um, connections and all your cuteness to ask them to help you get things done. (laughs) Uh, I mean, you know, because if you ask, if you can pay them, they'll probably say no. But (laughs) if you have a story, you've fallen in love with the story and you really want to turn it into English, you might try to ask the publisher, but they might be so slow that you'll grow a beard before you can get a reply. (laughs) Um, If you wanted to, you could ask an agent and that would make sense in some language pairs, but most Chinese authors don't have agents. So the best thing to do if it's like a modern author is to find out what platform that author likes to hang out on and ask for permission to translate the story through that social media. Um, Because they might have email, but they might not respond to email quickly enough. Um, And if you are not born in China or not currently living in China, you might not be able to make an account for some of these platforms nowadays. Right, yeah. You need your real name and the like Chinese phone number or things like that. So Mm. my tip is ask for help and then you'll probably get permission fast enough that you can make things happen. I have an anecdote that slightly goes towards what you just said. Um, So I put this podcast up on a Chinese podcast host called Shimalaya because the main feed I use is hosted on SoundCloud and SoundCloud's blocked. So that means all the feeds that come from SoundCloud, yeah. his friends can't get without VPN. So um, I think it was at the suggestion of a former show guest that I use Shimalaya. So I tried to sign up 
and there was a I had to submit my passport uh, like a picture of me holding my passport where uh, for most users that would be them holding up their Chinese ID and it didn't work first couple times oh and I gosh. thought I thought god damn it it just doesn't work for foreigners uh, so that former show guest actually offered to he sent me a picture of himself holding his ID and said put the account under my name which is just a huge amount of trust on his part and yeah. it, it turned out it, I wasn't uh it turned out I was able to sign up with my own ID. I didn't need to go under his name. But, I, you know, it's amazing um, how some of my Chinese friends before and after living in China would, would do things like that, would help you out across the, the bureaucratic internet hurdles. They're used to finding workarounds. And so, you know, if you're going to do stuff that relates to China, you need to be slightly comfortable with doing workarounds as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. I guess that's the way I um, learned from living in China. Mm-hmm. That matches my experience. Um, what you said about using all your cuteness, do you mean uh, my mom? <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, another workaround. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so we've talked about corresponding um, with Song Aman, and it's great to hear that you guys have, um, I guess, got on so well together professionally. So let's go on and talk about this story of hers that you translated. Although, although I've just remembered, you mentioned a story called 49 Degrees, that's the one that's on Paper Republic, right? The one that anyone can read for free yes. online. Yes. So if you search 49 degrees and then read Paper Republic, most of the time it'll go immediately to that short story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think I've mentioned on the show before, but Paper Republic is just the amazing place to learn about Chinese literature and uh, the translation of Chinese literature to English. And they've got a little section of the website called Read Paper Republic, where there are lots of these uh, short stories translated to English by really interesting authors whose books aren't always out there in English that are just, you know, it's a web page. Anybody can read it. So, yeah, yeah, it's a really great resource and it's made me a better translator being able to interact with the people that are on there. Yeah. And um, a little shout out to any, I guess, any fan of an author or translator of an author. Uh, Eric Abrahamson, the guy who's, or one of the guys who's in charge of Paper Republic, he gave me a... Uh, editing privileges to their database so if there's a translated work missing from a paper republic database i've got the go ahead to add it to there i, I did that for some of brian holton's uh, the last show guest translations so if anyone see, you know can see that there's something missing from that database i, I don't mind adding it but yeah um that aside let's talk a little bit about gong sun's dream or sorry gong sun's dreams this Song of Man story for our episode. So um, this is the only Song of Man story I've read. I think I, I think I read 49 Degrees a while ago, but it's kind of gone from my memory. So I'm going to say this is the only one in my mind, so to speak. That's fine. So um, where would you kind of place or even rank the story among her other works? That's kind of a tricky question because Song Aman is a young writer. Um, so I don't know if we can rank everything that she's done or say exactly where this will place in her career. Right. But I can tell you that um, she chose this one to be included in a grant application because Song Aman and I are trying to get her book of short stories translated into English. Mm-hmm. And in order to do that, we'll need to apply for a grant. So Song Aman said, do this one. It's got a lot of cultural items, and I think it's a special story. So I do know that this one is close to her heart. That is, that's cool to know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a, I think I can see why she, she feels it's very strong. Because I remember, um, like, well, I think this applies to a lot of short stories, but especially in school, in English class, they'd always tell you the best short stories and the best poems you need to read over and over. And the first time I read this, well, I'll admit, I was um, I was sitting out on the, the wee porch because it's starting to get warm enough to do that on a warm enough evening. Um, and where I'm staying right now, it's a little cabiny thing my girlfriend lives in. So I was watching the sun go down. It was getting dimmer. I had a nice wee tin of pale ale and I wasn't as focused on the story as I could have been. So that meant there's all the kind of really intricate intricacies, intricate intricacies, <laughs> I'm going to go with that, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. passed by me. And when I reread the story, there's actually some huge details I realized um, had, had slipped by me. Not, not that this says anything about the story, more about me. And I'm sure if I read this story a third time, I would have new thoughts and uh, new things I appreciated that I hadn't hadn't caught it seems to be very layered and and interlinked there's like a lot of unwritten stuff between the lines that you could interpret one way or the other 
And I guess as a translator, you probably read the original Chinese from start to finish and line by line quite a lot of times. Um, so d- did you feel like you were going quite deep down a rabbit hole or maybe even a wormhole, a wormhole in time, as, as uh, we'll talk about probably in a bit? Oh my goodness, yes. Um, usually when I'm doing like business work, if it's a document that's 8,000 words, you know, I can do that in two or three days, no problem. And the short story took me months. I went right. back and forth on all these words. And I mean, okay, it was a, a side project, so I wasn't spending a full day on it any day. But I, I would just keep thinking about, okay, well, is this word better translated as A or B? And, oh, hang on, how am I going to make it clear that this is happening? And oh, lots of questions. And even though, you know, Song of Man is very helpful, it still takes a long time to figure out what my questions are even. <laughs> right. And I was going through Google Books, I was reading about the five elements in Chinese uh, philosophy mm-hmm. and the architecture of homes in ancient China. How do you describe those eaves? Right. Uh, and then when I thought I had it figured out, like, okay, this is my super strong draft, I uh, sent it to a trusted friend. His name is Dave Hasem. Oh, yes. I'm not sure if you've met Dave yet, but... His well, name pops up a few times. Yeah. <laughs> he's, a, he's part of the Paper Republic team. Mm. So I um, reached out to him and I said, make this beautiful. Please, please help me. Please, I'll pay you. <laughs> and um, he identified spots where the text was echoing something above that I had not noticed at all. So I think I completely agree that uh, you have to read the story a lot to even realize how many layers there are. Mm. And the better that a writer is, the more difficult it is for the translator to do their work justice. Mm-hmm. So I might spot a rabbit hole and then I reach the rabbit hole and I go all the way to the end and back. But then I also need informants, you know, people who know Chinese culture well. Yeah. Um, and then I probably need the help of other smart people who like to read books, who can spot things that have missed, you know, to make sure that the story is the best it can possibly be. Yeah. Um, I'm probably going to talk a little bit about the plot here. I'm going to reveal the big um, embarrassing thing that I missed. <laughs> Which That's first, right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, even if we do spoil the plot, it's such a mysterious story that just a raw description of the plot won't rob it of its um, value. So, yeah, the thing that I missed to to give some context, basically, we have a character called Gong Sun mm-hmm. who seems to have inherited a condition of having extremely vivid, maybe even like visionary mm-hmm. dreams, and it seems to run maybe in the men in his family, and then we also. Uh, meet a character also called Gong Sun, who's living, I guess, maybe during the Qing dynasty, certainly before moder- modernity, who's facing some other, well, he's he's also going through some kind of vexing times, let's say. And the embarrassing thing I can admit is on my first read, I did not realize that we were going back in time. I thought he was just doing, <laughs> I thought he was just doing some traditional style painting. I didn't <laughs> catch the kind of, because it never says outright. Now we're in 200 years in the past. You just, um, if, if you're reading properly, you can see like there's references to like farming tools, um, traditional style housing. He's like a literati gentleman. Everyone else yeah. is a peasant. But yeah, um, stupid Angus, blank that. <laughs> no, no, it's not and, stupid. It's, it's subtle. It's, it's subtle. It's subtle. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah. again, it's not a comment on uh, the the story not making it clear enough or your translation um, not making it clear enough. It's just the style. It's like a show, don't tell sort of style. Really nicely done. But yeah, I would recommend if people are reading this, don't treat it like a, a piece of fluff. Read it read it closely. Yeah, or, or give it two, um, two reads, you know, one to just let it flow and wash over and one to be like, so what is happening here? <laughs> yeah, totally. It was making me think of quite a lot of different... Um, other things I've read, not not necessarily that it was strictly referencing them, but the idea, so kind of, correct me if, if you think I've got this wrong, but it seems like we, we realize the Gong Sun, who's in our time, seems to be in his dreams, perhaps living the life of his ancestor. And the ancestor Gong Sun seems to be, at one point, he seems to have a dream of whatever modern Chinese town his descendant is in and he sees seems like he's seeing the big building so they're dreaming of each other and time isn't strictly linear which is interesting because my last guest brian holton was talking about how in lots of world cultures ancient china included time isn't linear it's a it's a spiral that kind of looks back on itself and yeah. i i've honestly there's a lot of um other books movies pop culture literary works that 
also have this kind of wormholes or strange flow of time. Uh, the ones, the one that popped into my head when I started using the word wormhole was Donnie Darko. Have you ever seen the film Donnie Darko? I have not. No. So that he's not dreaming of his ancestors, but uh, he is. Uh, have, it's this boy who's having some mental issues, but his visions or dreams seem to be pointing to something that even you as the viewer can't quite grasp. Especially, there's there's a director's cut that spells it all out, but in the original cut, the film is kind of like a weird dream, which almost adds up, but doesn't quite. And although it's not, I don't think it's really much like the story, the feeling of being a waking dream that doesn't quite add up the way a mathematical equation does, I think is one way of thinking about the story. Yeah, and it's even though it doesn't add up, that's kind of part of the charm of the story, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Well, life never really adds up, does it? I I actually, I have seen your name. So if you want to chat about that one, I thought that was such a great film. It was gorgeous. Yeah, I rewatched it just recently with my girlfriend. That's why it was on my mind. Oh, I see. Yeah, I watched it, gosh, I think it was last year. And I've only seen it once. So for the most part, it was kind of letting it wash over me and kind of ignoring confusing parts. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But I think it's pretty easy to accept that time travel is a a trope or you accept that everyone that we're meeting is normal in the story, except for a handful of people who have always been strange. And it kind of runs in the family. You know, that comes up in the Japanese film as well. Like she has this, but probably her grandmother had the same ability to jump through generations. Mm -hmm. So it's fun. You have a suspension of disbelief and then you can go somewhere interesting. Yeah. And I had a kind of a very Gong Sum's dreams slash your name kind of magical experience of watching it, where while I was watching it, I was being emotionally moved quite strongly, let's say, um, and it was partly by the film itself, but it was partly just nostalgia for watching it the first time. So I was linking back with myself from a year or two ago in Shanghai <laughs> watching it and thinking of him, but also thinking of the characters in the film, but not quite remembering stuff. There's a he- the, there's a plot twist maybe about halfway through your name, which I totally blanked. So just like Gong Sun, who doesn't quite remember his past, I did not remember the main slab of the story and was quite embarrassed to have forgotten, just like I was embarrassed to have blanked that in the first read that Gong Sun's Dreams is a story in two times. So yeah, um, quite a convoluted um, anecdote there. But just I, th- I think it illustrates how all these things, weird things that we experience can link together across time. Yeah, and how, um, you know, time travel or things being unexpected, people having these weird extra powers that exists in Japanese film, that exists in Chinese literature, you can find it all over the place. And if that's what you're looking for, yeah, you can find it in Chinese mm. literature. Have you ever had, um, and we all, we all have deja vu, have you ever had a dream of the future or a dream of a thing which ended up coming true? Oh, I think usually I dream in the backwards direction, but I have had like dreams of like places in my hometown that come up again and again and again. Mm. Yeah, I've I had I've had a, a strange thing in my dreams recently where I keep dreaming I'm going to take someone to visit some Korea town in China, but and it's happened re- enough times that I can picture this place that was in the dream, but it's totally not real. It's not a place I've ever been. <laughs> but um, to get to the point, I did um, I did dream the future once. I'll try and tell this story as quickly as I can. Uh, basically, in my uh, secondary school, when I was a teenager, they did a competition to encourage kids to eat their lunch in the school and not on the streets outside, where they would ring a bell. And if you were at the front of the dinner, like the, the dinner lady queue... Uh, the, the cafeteria queue when the bell went, you'd get a prize. And um, w- one day I had a dream that I came home in the dream. I came home from school. I saw my little brother on top of the stairs with a shopping trolley. And in the shopping trolley was a CD. And he'd won the CD for getting the, having the bell go when he was in the cafeteria queue. And I went and had a look at the CD. And it was uh, it was a compilation of I think hip hop and R and B, and there were two. It was blue, <laughs> and there were two scantily clad uh, black ladies on the back of it. <laughs> and a few days later, maybe a week later, I came home. There was no shopping trolley, but my wee brother had won the, the exact same competition, and he'd got a Ministry of Sound dance music compilation with two Whoa. scantily clad, I think they were white <laughs> or tanned ladies. Um, 
<laughs> on the back. And That's I am epic. Not up. Yeah. So I don't know. I, this is really on a tangent, but um, I feel like what's the difference between that and a memory of the past in your dream? They don't seem totally different. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's a rhetorical question. I wasn't really expecting an answer. <laughs> the other, the other story that this reminded me a wee bit of, um, which comes up a lot on the show, and it was the sh- topic of the show's first episode, mm-hmm. uh, was a madman's diary. Did 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 you see that at all? Or when I mentioned that, did did you see it, or do you think that's a, a bit of a reach? Um, I've read it, but it's been a while. I do think that um, in certain times. Chinese literature can be like a little bit more direct and sometimes it can be more indirect. Mm. So I think at that time it was okay to have like political undercurrents. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I think Song Man kind of avoids talking about anything in a political way or, yeah, you know, the idea that, in this story. or living in a dystopia or whatever. I don't think she aims to put people in uh, doomsday scenarios. Right. Um, so the, the thing that was reminding me of Madman's Diary, especially in the second reading. So in a Madman's Diary, there's a guy, he seems to be somewhat educated. He's living in a small town and he suspects that everyone is evil and crazy and out to get him and suspects that they're cannibals. And in the flashbacks to maybe the 1800s or, or 1700s, the ancestral Gong Sun uh, hears rumors from everyone that he wants to kill someone. So it's oh, almost right. an, almost an inverse of the mad of the madman's diary. I don't know if it really means anything apart from just the feeling of paranoia and maybe some class divisions. But yeah, it was just a thing that jumped out at me a wee bit. Maybe because Madman's Diary is just it's one of the first pieces that in Chinese sci-fi is the first Chinese literature I read. So it's always in my mind. I can't really escape it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, would you like to have some technical discussion about? translating this story yeah go on then because i think i've basically just rambled my weird theories about dreams at you probably not every listener (laughs) wants more of that um so we've talked about a few technical uh issues already and we've also talked about some i think through wechat and the internet and i wonder if we can relate them to this story gongson's dreams in particular I haven't really thought about how to do that. I'm just kind of wing it. So first of all, we we were talking a little bit about different kinds of editing. So I'll just try and rattle them off. Hopefully I've not missed anything. So one kind of editing that exists is developmental or substantive editing, which is basically maybe the one that people think of the most when they think of editing, where an editor gives feedback about the author's story and they try to make improvements or changes um, that's one kind of editing and then there's line editing this one is going through a story line by line looking for basically not looking to change the story but to maybe look at the way sentences are put together and then last of all you have proofreading where you're not aiming to change any ideas or uses of language you're just trying to catch mistakes i don't know how we could relate that to Gongsun's dream, but then maybe that's because I wasn't involved in making this translation. Did did you have to deal with these different kinds of editing or consider them as you were working? I think um, understanding that there's three kinds of editing or different stages that a book goes through is really important as a translator. Mm. And um, understanding that every book needs a substantive edit at some point needs a developmental edit at some point just kind of blew my mind i don't know i guess i thought that um you know awesome people like neil gaiman and whatever just kind of wake up in the morning and then write a whole book (laughs) i I didn't realize how there could be kind of a back and forth and that um authors do rely on all kinds of people to really professionally go through a book um but Every market is different too. So the way the US market works versus the way the UK market works versus the way China works is a little bit different. Some people argue that um, in China, printing is cheap and it's more about getting the book out quickly. Mm. Um, Or sometimes a book will start its life online and then the uh, motivations of the author is to make the book as long as possible. Whereas when a book goes to print, um, you expect readers to maybe read it in one go and you really don't want to make the book as long as possible. Right. And the motivation for them wanting it to be as long as possible is financial, right? Yeah, they get paid by the character. (laughs) Yeah. And I guess also, again, bring a little bit of a publishing perspective here, an ebook or an online version if the story is longer and the word count is longer, there is no physical item that's getting bigger. 
But the way yes. books work, if your book is too big, the spine won't be able to handle the book, which is why um, some uh, books like uh, uh, the, the Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire books, a lot, lots of editions of those, the physical editions have to be in a part one and part two, uh, especially in a language like German, where if you uh. translate from English to German, the uh, page count has to go up because it takes more space to write something in German than it does English. Right. And that might apply from Chinese into European languages. I think Chinese page by page, I think because of the way the characters work, is a lot more concise. Yeah. So if we talk about like page length, um, it does get longer. If we talk about word count, because there's spaces in between English words, it's right. a shorter word count. But right. when you talk about, you know, how many pages are going to be in that book, there'll probably be more pages in that book. Mm hmm yeah. But yeah, so I think that it can vary a lot. So for some Chinese books, the original is great, and you feel like the story has been carefully crafted. Um, there's a writer I really like called Ai, and like he does, <laughs> yeah, he does great short stories. He has a couple of um, full-length novels as well, and uh, he gave a speech where he talked about how he really admires all these other authors, and you know, he'll just tear apart a story and write it and rewrite it until he finally feels like this is worthy of uh, going out into the world, you know? Uh, Liu Cixi has also talked about that, that he's uh, written plenty of stuff that he doesn't think is ready for the world, so no, you're not going to see it, <laughs> Chinese reader or readers from other countries. So I think that for the case of Song Aman, she has done her developmental edit, her substantive edit somewhere, and I'm happy with the way she's written it. So I'm only making like micro decisions. Mm. You know, she references a cake. Do I call it meal crep cake or do I call it thousand layer cake? Or do I say a cake with many layers? Or, you know, this tiny question that's of a length of three words and would at most be called a line edit issue. Right. Once, once we're talking about books that are huge, you know, like Stanley Chan's book is actually quite big. Um, uh, and if, yeah, waist tight. There we go. Uh, if you and the team, you know, that includes the Chinese publisher, the English language publisher, the editors, and the author, if you agree that maybe the book is not going to sell in its current form, maybe the English side of the team will take a more editing role. Yeah. Um, so waist tight is an example of that. I think potentially um, three body problem is an example of that. Um, but maybe I would argue it's a it's a team decision, right? So Ken Leo knows knows who he needs to talk to, mm -hmm. and um, there might be places where he flags it and then later checks with the editor. Do you think this is better cut? And then the editor agrees. Uh, once two people think it's a good idea, they double check with the author, and then that part is taken out. Um, yeah, I think Ken Leo is a good example because um, he has a he has a really good relationship with the. Uh, his offers that he translates. I think he refers to them all as his friends. And I think especially uh, Chen Chou Fan, Stanley Chan, Stanley Chen, um, those two guys are great pals. But also um, I think both of them are quick to point out that a lot of the input that they got for the translation and the English versions of uh, like Waste Tide and stuff also come from the publishers at Tor or um, in the case of uh, Vagabond's uh, Hao Jing Fan's book from Simon & Schuster. But yeah, Ken Leo has good communication with both the original Chinese authors and his editors on the uh, English language or American side. So he's a, yeah. a, a good case for like minimal friction. Uh, um, I persuaded my girlfriend to read um, a translated Chinese book recently. She just finished a PhD <laughs> on uh, wolves in Anglo-Saxon literature. So I said, oh, okay. there's a Chinese book you should read. It's called Wolf Totem. And before I knew it, she'd ordered it off Amazon. And I've since learned that's an interesting case because although the English version of that book is pretty chunky, it's missing a lot. Uh, Howard Goldblatt, either well, either the translator Howard Goldblatt or the publisher said this this book in its original Chinese form is massive. So that's a case where a lot was removed. But I think in this instance, the author wasn't too pleased about a lot of the changes. So there was a bit of friction between him and Howard Goldblatt. I, I think it, it uh, turned out all right in the end, but it's an interesting contrast with a book like Waste Time. Definitely. And it's, I mean, uh, Ken Leo really has an eye for it because he's already an author. Right. right. He writes in English, he writes his own stuff. Another excellent translator is Jeremy Tiang, who you've talked about before. Mm. Um, he uh, writes his own plays. He reads his text out loud to make sure the dialogue sounds authentic. And so I think that um, 
when you have an eye for it and then you also have that diplomat role that you can take on saying uh listen for the oh so we were uh, just cut off there i temporarily got sent to a different dimension or place in time but and um, we were just talking about uh, different kinds of relationships translators can have with their authors and the editors and we'd been comparing uh, Wolf Totem translated but well, written by Jiang Rong translated by Howard Goldblatt and uh, Waste Tide uh, by Chen Xiu Fan translated by Ken Liu was there anything else you wanted to say about either of those uh, Michelle or do you think we're good yeah I guess just for my own part um, I take it on a case-by-case basis and I try to only translate living authors right. and try to only sign contracts where I think I will be allowed to have access to the author because mm. I find that makes a difference that um, is good for the book as a whole yeah um, you've reminded me so I'm a total amateur here uh, my area of expertise is i did a dissertation and now i do a podcast and i'm not even fluent in both languages but like from my observation whatever from whatever standpoint you would call this the best kind of translators or translation seem to be ones where like you said there's correspondence between the translator and the off uh, the off yeah the author and the translator and they've got a good relationship and what else is it about how they also need to be able to write well, like can write yes, well. Yes, that's it. Yes, yeah. So first, first point was a good relationship and correspondence between the author and translator. The other was, like you said, it's often really great if that translator also writes their own stuff, but they at least need be, to be able to write a nice sentence and a nice paragraph in English. That really seems to help. And the third point this is like a bonus. It, it's really great if the author is a good advocate of a the book that they've helped. Did I say the author? I meant the translator. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, it's really good if the translator does like, I guess, helps with promo and marketing for the book they've helped translate and fly the flag for their author. But also in the case of all the translators who are involved with um, Paper Republic, that they take a broader view and promote whatever language, well, I guess in this case, Chinese, if they're promoting translated Chinese books and fiction, that seems to be an indication of like, whether it's going to reflect good, well on one book, maybe not, but from like a holistic point of view, it's a thing that comes across really great to me. So not, not trying to talk shade about Howard Goldblatt, he seems to take the writerly box. He's a great writer. He, sometimes, he seems to have a mixed record in relationships with his authors. He seems to really take the box of promoting his authors. Like he did a huge amount for Mo Yan in translation. But the box, I, not, I'm not saying he is a, a, a selfish person, but what he didn't seem to do as much is fly the flag for translated Chinese stuff as a whole. Or if he did, not as much as these translators who are kind of, I guess, he are the next wave so the guys who are doing paper republic and i guess every translator who's been on this podcast in a way are not just flying the flag for their own authors it's like a you know the broader view yeah i agree <laughs> yeah not much more to say there is there um i'm glad you agree um, <laughs> what, what was the next question yeah so another, uh, maybe, yeah. maybe another thing that could make a translator a better translator is their uh, areas of expertise or their life experience. So we were saying earlier, um, Song Aman is amazing at writing about lots of different people and putting themselves in their shoes. And of course, like an author or a translator does need to have this ability to take a different perspective, but sometimes they are not good at it or they're not able to, or just having particular experiences or perspectives um, lend something I think Ken Leo mentioned this in my interview with him. He said it when new translations of Homer come out from the original Greek into English and they're translated by a woman, just by the fact it's a female translator, we get a new angle and new things come out through translation. And that doesn't necessarily reflect anything bad on the original translators, but it, he, he was trying to say like the life experience or the identity of the translator can be um, important. Do you think that, really holds true? Um, it depends. <laughs> mm. um, from a practical perspective, if I only chose to translate women who grew up in the suburbs with a certain education level, I would not have enough work to survive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I better have some flexibility there. From a philosophical perspective, I think if I could not recreate somebody's experience that I read 
whether that was in Chinese or in English, just because I hadn't gone to the experience myself, I think that would show a lack of empathy. Mm. So if you have the imagination to put yourself in those shoes, and if you have the empathy to feel the feelings that the character is feeling, hopefully you should also be able to transfer that over. Um, but at the same time, I think that if the Chinese author has an agenda and I don't agree with any of it, Mm. then probably I'm not the right translator for that book. I should probably just let that job go to somebody else. Right, because you Oh, might. it does matter, yeah. Yeah. Um, then the same thing is true in the other direction, as we mentioned a little bit already. If the translator and the source text author have a special relationship, that might create a little bit of magic, and the book might do better overall. So it's worth the effort to find a translator that seems to match. But then you can also, you can kind of build a team... Um, based on what you have. So I've done co-translations. Nikki did a co-translation for a fiction book recently with, I think, uh, Dylan Levi King, correct me yeah, if I'm wrong. Uh, Shanxi Opro. Uh, Very good. Um, and recently I was interpreter at a really cool poetry reading. So the source text was in Chinese and the poet was Yu Yoyo. Yu Yo Yo. Mm -hmm. um, and it was translated by A.K. Blakemore and Dave Haysom. Right. So Dave Haysom is a dude. The Chinese translator is a woman who spends a lot of time talking about um, maybe sexual issues, abuse issues, stuff like that. Right. So Dave was using his um, knowledge of Chinese and of how translation works for literary context. And then A.K. Blakemore was the one who's, um, she's a practicing poet. And could be like, this sounds right. This doesn't sound right. What's mm. going on here? Or you've over-explained here. This is poetry. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so between the three of them, they were able to create this English collection of poems. Or actually, it's a, it's a bilingual. So the left side is the Chinese and the right side is the English. Mm -hmm. So I guess you could argue that um, since Chinese, you can't always find the exact person that perfectly matches what you're looking for mm. you can um, either go for a co-translation some kind of collaboration or make a match by connecting uh, a poet that's based in the UK with a translator that has lived in the UK before that understands both cultures and then can act as the bridge to make that thing happen mm. it's interesting um, I don't really have any point to make here but I am reading a book just now that has a lot of co-translations. Cool it's uh, the sci-fi anthology I picked up in uh, the, at the Leeds conference when I, I met yourself, uh, The Reincarnated Giant. And so it's a lot like Ken Leo's sci-fi anthologies, but um, not only is it all different authors, it's all also all different translators. But some of those stories have one translator, others are co-translated. And I think in, I, I, I would need to check the book and I'm, I don't want to leave my chair. But I think in a lot of the cases, uh, one of the translators will be like Chinese, a Chinese speaker from China, or they maybe look like they've got a Hong Kong name. And then there'll be a, a, a quote unquote Westerner who's co-translated, maybe for the reasons you've described. I don't know. But um, I have no point to make there. It's just... Um, immediately what springs to my mind when I think of co-translations, because I've not read a whole lot, I don't think. I think most Chinese uh, to English stuff I've read has had a sole translator. Well, I'm a firm believer of having, uh, you know, working in a team when you can. So mm. the Paper Tiger was about 60% translated by me and about 40% translated by Nikki. But then we served as the first editors for each other's work. Mm -hmm. And um, that meant that we caught errors that the English only editor wouldn't be able to catch. Yeah. Um, so that's, in my mind, that's a definite win. That's a good thing for the book. It's nonfiction that makes it even more important. Right. Um, and there's other instances. I'm pretty sure A Hero Born as well has a collaboration between someone who's native Chinese speaking and someone who's um, yes. not native Chinese speaking. I think she's actually native Swedish, if I remember yeah. correctly. Anna, Anna Homewood and Gigi or Gigi Chang. I don't know how you say it. G-I-G-I -I Chang. Uh, Anna Homewood. Let me just check. She's definitely Scandinavian. I'm going to Google which country. Yeah. But yeah, I guess if, if they're doing a series, although Anna Homewood did book one, Gigi Chang did book two, I don't know about book three, but you need um, consistency across the series. So you would have a little bit like um, Ken Leo and Joel Martinson doing three body. They, just by necessity, I think it's necessity that they've got more than one translator because the workload is so big. But then by necessity to have consistency, they need to collaborate 
so that they're using the same renderings for things and that they agree on those renderings. And yeah, Swedish. Yeah, you're right. Yes. Uh, it's also possible um, that there's more co-translations than you see. Uh, right. So for myself, Beijing, Beijing, I had a lot of questions um, and I didn't rely on just one person. I relied on a bunch of different Chinese friends depending on what my question was. And then um, <laughs> I sent one chapter of the text to every friend from high school and college I could think of, um, mm. which I'm pretty sure is an unorthodox way of approaching things, but um, it's really it amazing what kind of feedback you get. And sometimes what you want is just somebody who reads a lot. You don't necessarily want someone who uh, knows both English and Chinese or who knows the bigger picture. You just want to say, yeah, this reads well. <laughs> oh, for- pardon me. Bless you. Ugh. I was trying to hold that back until you reached the end of a sentence. I'll repeat it. It's fine. Oh, okay. Go for it. So sometimes it's um, maybe not visible that a translation is actually a co-translation. So um, mm. for myself, uh, for Beijing, Beijing, I asked a lot of Chinese friends for help. And I actually asked a lot of my friends from high school and friends from college to read just one chapter and tell me any feedback they had, if it made sense, mm. if there was something weird about it. Um, I'm just a firm believer that getting an extra pair of eyes on something or getting a little bit of feedback helps you realize if you're speaking in something that sounds funny to you and not funny to others or mm-hmm. you know, just you might be overlooking something that somebody else will catch for you. Yeah. I mean, I found in my own writing and editing other people's writing and putting together copy for various things, like I've been doing some, some book, bar, book blurbs recently, if you look at your own writing for too long, you just not not necessarily because you're in love with your own writing, but you lose objectivity. Um, it's a little bit like when suddenly you hear a word and your brain stops recognizing the word and it just becomes a weird sound. And yeah, you need a yes. second pair of eyes or a second brain to um, have like the quote unquote normal view of it because you've just lost the normal objective view. Yeah. Or my uh, professor Francis Jones used to say, you know, give it time in the uh, what do you call it? In the drawer? Mm. You know, so if you can, if it's a short story, sleep on it and then come back to it with fresh eyes so that you can see if there's an echo in it or if something makes sense to you <clears throat> now, doesn't make sense to you now, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. on, a, on a theme of Gongsun's dream and like remembering past versions of yourself um, and on the theme of talking about movies I was watching with my girlfriend, um, a celebration for her finishing her PhD uh, Viva last night we were watching uh, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban and I mentioned that um, the highest mark undergraduate essay I ever uh, the highest mark for an undergraduate essay I ever got was on Harry Potter and I, I, I'd put the I put it uh, I'd put that essay on my blog because I needed to show it to uh, I think it was a job application to student press office <laughs> and so it's still up there. And she said, oh, let me see it. And I, I showed her it, but not before I skim read the first few bits. And <laughs> it was weird because reading your own writing from, I guess, be it a month ago or a year ago, but especially further back, you are seeing this like other version of yourself that's been frozen in a way. And it was, it was weird because some of it I was like, yeah, this is great stuff. Um, and it's really, it's my own, it, I still think in this way. And other stuff, I was like, who is this? Who is this person? This is disgraceful. It's so bad. Oh, I completely agree. I look back at stuff and I'm like, really? You thought you were hot stuff? Really, <laughs> Michelle? Yeah. Or worse still, oh my God, my, my, my teacher thought this was hot stuff. This is embarrassing. <laughs> but yeah, um, going back to uh, the technical, leaving behind weird idea about time travel um you introduced me to a couple of interesting um terms i guess grammar terms that a translator would deal with especially a chinese to english translator um they are parataxis and hypotaxis so maybe some of our listeners who study chinese and translation know what these are but for those of us like me who are not from this world, could you teach them what are pyrotaxis and hypotaxis and how would these uh, terms affect yourself when you're doing your job as a translator? Well, I guess the first thing that I want to start off with is if you don't know any linguistic terms, that's okay. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I didn't learn this term until later in life and I used to confuse them a little bit. Um, It's not necessary to know everything in a clinical or really academic way. Yeah. Uh, you can take a more intuitive approach to it for the most part. Mm. And my shorthand for this 
is that Chinese people treat commas like spices. They just shake them in until the story tastes right. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you just see a lot more commas if you do it on a raw numbers. But also Chinese has two commas, which I imagine you know, Angus. I, um, I think I know what they look like on the page. I didn't know that you could use both, if that makes sense. So I'll, I'll tell you about the two right. and... Any listeners who are curious, they didn't realize. Um, there, there's one comma which works like the English comma that's just breaking up a phrase. And then they have the serial comma, which looks a little bit more slanted. Hmm. It looks like a forward slash, I right. think is what it's called. And the serial comma uh, separates things in a list. So I'm going to buy apples, oranges, eggs, and flour. Um, in between apples, oranges, eggs is going to be a serial comma. Interesting. Yeah, I can't claim to have known that. Well, that's the one thing where Chinese is kind of being more precise and English is being less precise. But mm. on the other side, generally Chinese is just a little bit less precise. So it can start a sentence talking about thing A and then end a sentence starting with things, you know, talking about thing B as long as they're connected in a thematic way. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to be dependent clauses. They don't have to be independent clauses or anything. They're just groups of ideas. Commas go in where the author thinks it makes sense or where it makes sense to take a breath. Mm -hmm. um, and English can only do that if there's a logical connection between clause A and clause B. Right. Um, so that's usually where non-native English speakers will make a mistake. They don't realize that the best thing to do is to split up that sentence yep. or to change the subject so that it still works. Um, also, English just loves that subject for object setup, and Chinese doesn't need it, right? Like, xia yu la is a sentence. It's raining. We have yeah. to add the word it's. It's not there in Chinese. Yeah, you can't just be like, oh, raining. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Rain, new situation. <laughs> um, what was it so it's, say? I don't know, like it's, it's not that you have to know that Chinese can have parallel ideas happening at the same time. It's enough if you can recognize and kind of remind yourself, okay, Chinese is fuzzy and English doesn't like being that fuzzy. So sometimes we have to explicate to make the English work. Um, but I don't know, when I read other people's translations, it reminds me, you know, English, every language in the world is flexible. Just because yes. English likes subject verb object doesn't mean that every book has to have every sentence as subject verb object. You can just uh, say beautiful girl, full stop. Um, mm -hmm. Depending on the situation, that might work better than creating a very plain and straightforward you know, grammatical sentence. Mm -hmm. I can remember very clearly in primary school in English when we had lessons on commas, um, the, teach, like the textbooks would tell you that there was a particular way that you should use commas, how many you can have in a sentence. And your teachers would, um, for the sake of keeping things simple, would tell you this is the way to do it. Yeah. And sometimes the textbooks and teachers would contradict each other. And me, as a kid, I was probably, um, I hadn't quite grasped the idea that things, reality is flexible and doesn't follow strict rules. So I found it frustrating as a kid. Um, yeah. I wanted to use more commas than the textbook said. And it bothered me because I thought I had the rule and the textbook said it had the rule. And of course, an adult would know it's not that simple. Um, so yeah, my, as, as, as a um, younger person, just as a way of rebelling against the books, I would use commas more than you quote unquote should. But then when I tried to take my writing more seriously, I could see I was overusing commas. And then I like reacted to that and became a little bit of a comma. I don't like throwing the word Nazi around, but a bit of a comma Nazi, <laughs> like a, a comma authoritarian. Um, and now, when I most of what I read these days is Chinese to English, um, to be honest. And right. because I've got this hypersensitivity about commas, and I've learned um, that Chinese is more comma friendly, let's say, if I see some English prose that's been translated to Chinese, and I start to see sentences with lots of commas, it might be just style and done for effect, but my little um, angry little comma brain from childhood starts saying this is a bad translation because it's inherited the Chinese grammar and not dealt with it. But of course, it's doubly complicated because in English, you can have more or less commas. It's a and how you punctuate can be a question of style as, as well as rules. Yeah, I think that um, a really good podcast, if you have extra time to listen to podcasts, oh, is The Allusionist. A-L-L-U-I, 
U S I O N I S T. Allusion with ist on the end. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Having trouble there. Um, but she's, she talks about how over the years of making the podcast, she, reals, she realizes how kind of unnecessarily strict she was about how language should be used mm. and how that gradually started started to fade away and how she realized that language is always evolving and there's different ways to use language for different reasons. Um, and so as a translator, um, you might have your reasons, but you need to make sure you can always back up. If you're going to use the same amount of commas as Chinese, you can't just say, well, there's five commas in the Chinese sentence. Therefore, I'm using five commas in my English sentence. There's got to be like, you know, this is a stylistic thing that I can tell is different from other Chinese authors. And I think that the English sounds like similar or has a great effect if I also do the same number of commas. It's a real challenge to um, kind of reach that level, let's say, to get beyond our childhood brains of, but I know how many commas should be in here. This is right or this is wrong. Right. Or, Oh, I really wanted to mention there's a there's a translator called Brendan O'Kane. Yeah, I've seen him on Twitter. Yeah, he was interviewed on uh, some website, and he was talking about how it took him a long time to um, stop being a slave to the source text and stop following the source text so closely. So when you first start, a lot of translators might be a little bit shy or overcautious, hesitant. Mm. And once you realize kind of what the effect is and what you need to do to make the effect equivalent in English, you start taking um, maybe bigger risks a little bit or, you know, you just, you use a bigger w range of strategies. You try different things out. And again, there could be five different people that translate the same text and they all come up with different solutions. But if you can back it up, I think there's... If most of those, or maybe all of those, are going to be valid solutions. Yeah. Um, like I said earlier, I've been doing some writing copy, like blurbs and whatnot, and I've had back and forth with um, an editor. And it it is kind of fun because writing is an art form, and yet if uh, the, the there's, there's like a query or correction in your copy, and you you don't want to make the suggested change, then you have to justify whatever choice you've made. And normally I can, and it's kind of fun, like having logical reasons to justify your quote unquote literary or prose choices. But just recently something came up where um, I had, it was the end of a paragraph and I had a, like three things listed after a colon. Um, I can probably say what they are without get, uh, getting in any um, trouble. They were, um, a, death, sandstorms, and locusts. And it was like a list of perils. And the editor said, shouldn't this be, shouldn't death come last? So I was like, hmm, he is logically right. Um, so I figured he, I thought he probably wants it to be escalating. So locusts first, then sandstorms, and then death. But in my, my little inner writer was like, no, that doesn't sound good. And at the end, I said, maybe it's because having death first feels less blunt and more abstract, but basically I said, this is down to my own intuition. I can't logically justify this. Um, so let me, if, if you won't, if you don't want to let me have it, I, I have nothing to stand on, but if you would <laughs> like to trust my intuition, please huh. do. <laughs> and I feel like it's just yeah. a tricky thing with, with language. Um, there are some rules, but ultimately it's kind of like water. It, it is, it comes from the young, it comes, it springs from somewhere that you can't pin down. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and it's constantly changing, you mm -hmm. know, working as needed in the shape or the context that it's needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So now that our technical um, discussion has turned from like rules back into weird philosophy, um, let's march on and go to like the kind of odds and ends, some, some miscellaneous questions. Um, we teased before we had a word of the day. So we've already had some uh, cool phrases and whatnot, but like our formal word of the day, do, do you have one for us, maybe related to Song Aman or Gongsun's dreams? I think the word that I would pick would be Mofang, which is how you say Rubik's Cube or Magic Cube. Oh, right. So Mo is um, kind of means like devil or magic. Mm. And then fang means something that's square, or in this case, cube shaped. Mo so, fang, okay. Mo fang. Mm -hmm. Mo fang. It's um. She makes a kind of extended metaphor in her speech, and fingers crossed, everybody, we will get that on YouTube soon, so you can check it out. Mm. 
that was the little TED Talk esque uh, lecture that you sent me. Yeah, yeah. She gives a speech on Ishi, which is something very similar to TED Talk. I agree. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, what can I say apart? Oh, no. I, what I can say is uh, once it's up, I'll tweet about it with a link and point listeners to it in whatever way I can because it is worth watching. And it's a nice, it's a nice, um, well, you get to hear the author speak nonfiction, as it were, as well as just this story. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So another wee miscellaneous question, and this might take some uh, a little bit of context from yourself because she's not really a, a, that widely available in English outside of Read Paper Republic. Uh, but if you could live inside a Song Aman story, uh, which one would it be? I'm going to assume you wouldn't want to live in Gongsun's dreams because it doesn't <laughs> end very well for Gongsun. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to... Um, I'm going to choose the obvious answer. Maybe it's not an obvious answer, but she has one story that's called Tashir Wuri Ga Pangyo. He's a friend of mine. Mm. And it takes place in Chonburi in Thailand. Oh. I've never been to Thailand, but I'd love to live there for a month or two if somebody mm. lets me. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a translator's residency or something. Yeah. That, oh, so if I could live there for a while and not forever, I think that would be my choice. Okay. So all billionaires funding residencies who are listening to the podcast, take note. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And is it literally just for the setting or is it a kind of a happy little story? I think the, the other thing that's cool about it is that um, the two main characters are friends that decide to just go on vacation together. Mm. Um, you know, you get a lot of books that are boy meets girl or this is a family, you know, um, and this is just girls that are deciding to go on a group travel vacation together. And um, in their boredom, they start like making up stuff about other people on the trip. <laughs> Right. And so, yeah, first of all, nothing bad happens to anybody. But second of all, it takes place in a beautiful area. So that's, mm -hmm. that would be my choice. Yeah. Well, I won't bore listeners by talking about my holidays, but I can say I've been to Thailand and it's a nice place for a holiday. I'll say that much. It's a worthwhile visit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, cool. And not for like a crazy wild time, like the stereotype is about maybe like Bangkok. It is just a nice, it is a nice place to have a sunny, warm holiday. Okay. I was there in, although maybe not in the middle of summer, because I was there in February and I was sweating. So maybe that was the <laughs> right time of year to go. Um, right. I said I wouldn't go on and on about Thailand, so I won't. Uh, last miscellaneous question. It's your little self-promo slot. So first of all, although we, we did, I guess we've done this question before in the episode on the untouched crime. But again, uh, where can we find you online? Uh, where can we buy things that you've translated and what are you working on just now or what have you just got out recently that you'd like to give a shout out to? Yeah, um, you can contact me on my website if you have any questions. That's michellediter.com. Um, I post on LinkedIn sometimes. I, d I don't post very much on Facebook and I don't have a Twitter. Sorry, friends. Mm. Uh, if you're interested in buying one of my books, uh, typically it's Amazon that sells them because I don't know if you know, Amazon Crossing is not always available in mainstream bookstores. Right. So Amazon is a place to get the books. And please, please, please go take a look at 49 Degrees on Read Paper Republic and leave a comment so more people can learn about Song Aman. Mm, I'll put a link to um, 49 Degrees in the show notes for sure for listeners. Oh, that'd be perfect. Yeah. Mm, and I should just say a listener asked me, what are the show notes? Show notes is just jargon for the description of the episode that should be on your podcast provider. So if anyone's wondering what I mean by that. I don't mean the notes in front of me. I mean the episode description. That's where the links are. Yeah. And yeah. if not, you know, just ask, ask on Facebook, ask on Twitter, and I'm sure we can point you the way. Yeah. Um, I think I'll have promoted this in the start of the episode, the end, but um, another way to get in touch with myself and not just myself, but other listeners is um, in our recently launched, oh God, why have I forgotten what it's called? A Discord server. Um, so Discord, it, it's an app. It's I think it was designed um, for gamers, for their um, gamer conversations, but it is a really, it's probably the best place for like a community to have 
parallel group chats. So if you guys would like to talk about um, this episode or other episodes, um, there are links to join that Discord up on my Twitter, but also you can message me and I'll send you a fresh link or whatever. But yeah, um, so Michelle, before we go our separate ways, um, I'd like to get a wee chance to direct the listeners to some more like further reading as well as um, promoting your own books. Um, so if, if the listeners want to check out more writing by Song Aman in, in English or Chinese, where can they go? Or where could they find, if, if, if they want to find other writers who have a similar kind of style or in a, are in a similar vein to Song Aman, who would you recommend them? Ooh, um, it's hard to get a physical book of Song Aman's if you're not in China right now. But a lot of her short stories are online. So if you look for her name, Song Aman, that's Song Dai de Song. And then I guess the Chinese translation of Oman. So Aman. Uh, <laughs> you can that, uh, find her online. That's a Muslim name, I guess. I'm not sure. Again, not sure. I should be asking her more questions and double checking before I uh, make any theories. But right. anyways, her short stories are available there if you want to read them in Chinese. And right now, she only has one short story published in English, so you have to get that from Paper Republic. Right. Um, in terms of similar authors, there's not a lot out there if you specifically want um, a female author. Mm. I think she's, she's kind of special. There's one uh, female author that I know that I would definitely recommend is Chi right. Um Again, she doesn't have that much out in English, but the stuff that I've read I've really enjoyed. Uh, the book that I have is Goodnight Rose. Mm. And that's uh, the author is Chi Zijian, and it's translated by Poppy Toland. Right, cool. It just occurred to me, actually, I know another author who is, in, from my point of view, kind of similar. So I guess Song Aman, if we were going to put her under like a, a genre, it might be like literary fiction or, or something. But yep. um, there's a writer who, I guess, is packaged as a, a, sci- a Chinese sci-fi writer, but whose stories I've read aren't a million miles away from this one, Gong Sun's Dream, and that's Tang Fei. And I've, I've read two of Tang Fei's stories, one in Ken Liu's anthology, uh, Invisible Planets, another in Broken Stars. And they're a little bit different from, well, all, all, the, all the stories in Ken Liu's anthologies are quite different from each other. But if I was going to describe the stories in those two books, I would say they're, uh, they're the weirdest ones, or they're up there. They're very. She's, she writes quite strange stuff, but it's stuff that bends reality. And in both of those stories, the um, main character is is a woman. So I guess that's that's not a parallel with Gong Sun's dream, but maybe that's a parallel with um, uh, Song of Man's other stories. But yeah, I don't know. The, I I don't know if I can describe them better than that because they kind of they're a little bit they're a little bit like equations that don't quite add up to a a whole number or whatever. But there was a similar strange feeling. And actually, there was a thing that I remembered earlier, just after we were talking about films. There's a filmmaker who whose stories, uh, sorry, a filmmaker whose films gave me some similar vibes that Gong Sun's dreams did. I can't remember, because his name is often rendered in both the Western way, surname last, and the Chinese way, surname first. So I can't actually remember if I should be calling this guy Gan Bi or Bi Gan, but ha- have you heard of him? Actually, I haven't. Okay, well, I can recommend this uh, director. He's fantastic. He's uh, also not Han Chinese. Uh, he's um, he's one of the ethnicities from the south, like around Guizhou. I am not mm-hmm. going to. If I try and remember, I'll probably misremember. But he's he's not Han Chinese. He's very, especially when he made his first film. I think he was younger than I am now. He was in his, I think, early or mid twenties. And uh, the really, really, like the masterpiece of his is called Kylie Blues, um, Kylie Lan something, but English name is Kylie Blues. And mm-hmm. it has a similar kind of spaced out um, traveling through time, like a, a male main character who doesn't quite know where he's going or who he is. And then he made uh, another, he brought, when is it from? I saw it in Dundee just this year, I think it came out in China the year before, but he almost doubled down on the looseness of time to the point where like, although it doesn't feel like a sci-fi film, the little description in the cinema booklet call it a time travel film, but it's really more like a weird, hazy, things are unfixed than like a guy walking in a time machine sort of thing. But yeah, that one is called, the English name is Long Day's Journey Into Night, I think. 
So Kylie Blue's okay. long day starting tonight began or possibly can be. I think it's can be. Um, but yeah, that's... I mean, they're both right depending on how you decide to handle Chinese names. So exactly. no worries. Yeah. I'll stop, I'll stop um, tearing myself to pieces over that. Um, yeah, those are all our miscellaneous questions. That's our first further reading question. The final question is, what are you reading just now? I actually just finished Second Sister by oh, Chan yes. Ho Kei. So good. It's so good. <laughs> it knocked my socks off, and I hope we can do it as a podcast episode. It is so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, um, I also read Borrowed, The Borrowed, uh, and yeah. I can't decide if I like The Borrowed better or Second Sister. I just think they're both excellent. I really enjoy that author. Um, it's the kind of book that I finish, and I think, oh my gosh, I want to buy this for all of my friends so we can talk about it. Mm, I um I read that one when I was I think it was before before lockdown, but when the first um rumblings of coronavirus landing in the UK were um beginning to take effect, me and my girlfriend mm-hmm. had gone we were on a trip. We went down into England and I was reading Second Sister on the trains and she could tell oh, I was, wow. you know that thing when you're near someone, a friend or family or partner, and you can see they're really engrossed in a book and then once they're done, you pick up the book. Because you have to, you have to know what was magnetized. <laughs> yes. That's exactly oh, that's cool. Yeah, she grabbed it off me as soon as I was done with it and powered through it at about the same speed. Yeah. Oh, it's just it's excellent. Everybody should be reading that like as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. And it's it's you're not. I mean, it is a page turner, but you're not just powering through it because it's a page turner. It's also just fantastically done and fantastically translated by Mister Mister Chang, Jeremy Chang. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. I'm I'm planning to have him, or he's agreed to be on a future episode, but it'll be about um, Strange Beasts of China by Yang Ge, and that's not due to come out for a while. So unless I can, uh, you know, use my cuteness effectively to get him on earlier to talk about Second Sister, <laughs> might not have him on for that one. But, you know, I'm sure there's lots of people who've enjoyed reading it who might be able to get on, or I might just do it myself. You know, uh, uh, if... Nobody reaches out to Angus, which I recommend you do. It's super fun being on this podcast. And I'm not scary. Um, I'm very friendly. <laughs> I can possibly recommend somebody to you. We can try to set that up. All right, cool. Uh, we can do that after I uh, end the recording, uh, which I think it's time to do. So thank you so much for your time and being on, Michelle. It's, um, it's, it's been great that you are the very first guest to be on the main feed twice. The Only Vikings been on twice, but the second time was for Patreon. So <laughs> you get this, t- like you get this medal on a technicality, I suppose. But yeah, it was great I'll having you back. <laughs> and you know, if you want to be on a third time, I wouldn't say no. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that's the end of the interview. So another big, massive actually, thank you to Michelle for coming on the show. It's a fabulous chat, as I think I've already said. Now, just a few wee plugs, and then it'll be time for me to say goodbye. So. First thing I'd like to plug, uh, just because I'm also proud of it, is the Trichific map. So this is a wee custom Google map I've made. There's a link to it. There will be a link to it in the show notes. And basically, I every time I do an episode, I mark the author's hometown or approximately thereabouts. And if I can, the setting of the story on the map. So you can see kind of where all these people are from and where all these things in the world of fiction uh, are happening on a map and you can look around it and I've put photos on each item and a little description and there's even a rocket to Mars if you don't believe me check it out although be aware the rocket to Mars only works on your desktop browsers it won't work on your phone <laughs> so just be aware of that if you try and take the true uh, rocket to Mars so other uh, more earthly things to plug uh, or perhaps more digital things, uh, the, the, shows, the show's social media presence. So it has its own Instagram account. The username is Trichafic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. That is a way to keep updated with the show and to reach out to talk to me with any feedback you might have. We have a Twitter as well. It is uh, at Angus Likes Words. That's my own uh, Twitter account, but I mostly use it to promote the show. I am toying with the idea of making a a, a Twitter account just for the show, although, I don't know, I'm still still pondering that one. If you would like to support the show materially, that is, with money, if you'd like to help me uh, cover the hosting fees and just cover my teabag costs, which eat into most of of the money that I own, most of my income goes on teabags, 
So if you want to help me buy tea bags, uh, there's two places you can do it. There's Patreon, patreon.com slash truthific. That is a way to give a monthly uh, like recurring contribution. And in exchange, you get access to the various bonus shows I've recorded. Uh, I've put two up in the last two weeks. There'll be another one coming up uh, this coming week. I'm going to try and keep keep going with that. But So as it stands, there is hours of content up there and there's only going to be more. So that's what you get in exchange for being a Patreon supporter. And of course, my gratitude, my eternal gratitude. If you'd rather not have eternal gratitude and just have a one-off burst of gratitude and a personal thank you, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash trishofic again. So buymeacoffee.com slash T-R-C-H-F-I-C and it's exactly what it sounds like. You, I think on that website it is actually possible to give a recurring donation, but there's no bonus content. So really you should be using it to give a one-off donation. I'm really selling this, aren't I? Financial contributions aside, um, here's the other cool thing you can do that I've already mentioned twice in this episode, and that's joining the Discord, uh, which you can do with the links I've stuck up on social media, or just zap me a message and I'll send you an invite link. And do let me know if you try an invite link and it's not working, uh, let me know, that would be good. But yeah, that's a place where you can talk to all the different fans of the show who's all, who have also signed up. I'll be making a special channel just for this episode. But we've already got chats going about uh, wuxia, about, so that is like martial arts fantasy, if you don't know what wuxia is. Uh, Chinese sci-fi, which of course I've done lots of episodes on, various pieces of Chinese sci-fi. Uh, we've got a Mo Yan channel. What other channels do we have? We've got one on Chinese cinema, which is quiet for the minute, but if you want to talk about Chinese movies, we have one. And of course, if people want to suggest channels, I will, unless it's a really stupid idea, <laughs> I will just go ahead and make the channel. It's all about you guys, of course. Now. If there is any other way that we could call the most important way to support the show, in my opinion, it's spreading the word. Either online or, you know, if possible in these days of social distancing, face to face with real people. So as always, tell your family, tell your friend, tell your teacher, and tell your ancestor in whose strange yet familiar shoes you walk at night in your dreams. And until you wake and listen to the next episode, 再见。